Welcome back to Footy Classified. One of the stories of the year has been the renaissance of the Hawthorne Football Club. Many thought there was still a couple of years in their rebuild to come. Even as uh, late as round five, a lot of people thought that there was a fair way to go. Sam Mitchell, congratulations on making the finals. It's a, a mighty effort for you and your club. Yeah, it is. It's been uh, quite a journey so far, but um, new season starts now and excited to be a part of it. Unbelievable. Um, yeah, it's been unbelievable, Sam. And uh, you, you were really strong also at round five. And I remember challenging you here on this set around the decisions you made and all those sorts of things. But you've always looked ahead, haven't you? And, and had a plan for your football club, which you'd expect you to do. And, but has it come faster than you thought it would? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, this the buy going into the finals gives a little bit of time for reflection. Not yeah. too much because you're always you're always looking at the next challenge. But we did um, spend a bit of time this week looking at our original strategy and what the, the the parts that needed to be put in place and how consistent we've been and trying to get there. Now there was no sort of speed limit on how quickly it, it would go. But if you had a said um, finals this year, that would have probably been at the at the very at the very quick end of what we thought was capable. Well, back in 2022, here's what you had to say about your thoughts for the future. If we try and play the way Melbourne and Geelong are playing, they're going to be better than us at that. So we need to figure out what the next iteration of the game is and then play in that way. So then by, in three years' time, when everyone's trying to play this new style, we've already been playing and we've learnt all the mistakes and there's other teams saying, oh, we're not going to beat them at their game. They've been doing that for three years. What's been the, the DNA that you've been able to change at Hawthorne or, or at least cultivate um, you know, in recent times? It changes because of injuries and everything else that you've had along the journey. But there seems to be a really good feeling in your club and everyone knows what their job is. Yeah, I mean, I think there's some th parts of the game that are consistent for forever um, through all the generations about, you know, playing your role and playing selfless footy and all those things. But I think, you know, the way that the game has been played over each each iteration is it always evolves. And I think we've we've tried to to be at the front of it rather than be a follower. And, um, you know, it makes me a bit nervous watching that because everything we've planned for is to get to this point. And all the planning says that what, the way we're playing should stand up in finals. But... Um, we'll find out next week. I know you didn't have a line of sight on when you would get a crack at a senior coaching gig, but when you went to West Coast for that 2017 season as a player and made a final and then had a great role in the midfield coaching that won a premiership, were you thinking along those lines as far back as then about what you would do once you got your chance? Oh, I think everyone, I think a lot further back than that, if, you, if you're really honest. I think everyone, like Jack Gunston, I would say once a week, Jack Gunston, he'll come to me and he'll say, so why did you do that? And he's not asking me because he's interested in, um, you know, the, the message. It's about what's the motivation behind it. So I think you always have players that are thinking ahead about what, you know, what's the coach's motivation. And hopefully not all of the players are thinking that way. But I think once you've established yourself and you know how the coach wants you to play and you establish those things in your game, I think all of us, we all look at another coach. I watch every press conference of the, the other coaches and you say, oh, that's interesting. I wonder why he said that. And so you're always learning on the job. And um, part of that is as a player. Sam, a lot of coaches, like once they become head coaches, seem to oversee things. So they might have their line coaches, uh, midfield, you know. But to you, Nick Watson recently spoke about how you said, come into my office, you're not going to listen to anyone but me. I'm your goal-kicking <laughs> coach from here. And you're, you're involved with recruiting and uh, attracting players. So have you said, you know, I'm going to do this my way? And you're doing it, do you believe, a lot differently to how other people might do it as the overseer when you become the head coach? Um... Yeah, I think that, I mean, that's a convenient story and it makes sense when you look at it like that. But if I, if I actually use the Nick Watson as the example, we watched him play uh, against Richmond mid-season and he clearly just lost confidence with his goal kicking. Yeah. And so um, I actually went straight to Adrian Hickmon as the forward coach and said, OK, how do we, how do we go about this? And, and to us, the number one thing he needed was one voice. He's such an exciting player. The way you guys watch this and the way the fans have flocked to this first year um, player, he's been like that forever and so when everyone wants to help him, everyone wants to talk to him and so the message we had as a head coach and, and forward line coach was he needs one voice mm. and Adrian said I think you should do it um, and so then I went and spoke to him and uh, the players who I played footy with, they said I can't believe you're teaching goal kicking <laughs> um, but it wasn't about the skills I was teaching, it was about if my voice was in his head that would get rid of all of the others. Yeah. Are you teaching about the uh, in-game and post-game celebrations? I, I know you're not, but and I've heard you talk about this. I mean, can you just take us through it now that you're getting into a final and you have embraced this element of it, haven't you? And it's been so infectious for obviously the players involved, the fans obviously, and I, and I feel the wider footy community has come along for the ride with you this year as you're doing this type of behaviour in and post-game. 
Yeah, I mean, I think everyone celebrates in their own way. So, um, you know, if you watch Jack Gunston kick any of those goals or Luke Bruce, they give it almost nothing. They, they barely even smile. And, that, and that's their choice and that's fine as well. It's not fine with some of that crew. And the same way those older guys, you know, they maybe frown upon some of it. But it's all with good fun. And I think we look at the theatre of the game. This is an entertainment business. It's an entertainment sport. Now, we're not motivated by that. We're high-performance, high professional athletes, all those guys, and trying to perform at their best. But if you perform at your best, generally, most things that we love doing, we're better at. So if they're having a great time playing footy, it's not always possible, but that's, that's what we all aim for as coaches. But there's also a bit of stick involved, as well as the carrot. And uh, early on this year, you, uh, you, you let rip, and this was almost a turning point. Um, what was going on there? Were, were, were people, was the, the message sinking in, or was it something that you had to just jolt everyone and just say, right, okay, it's great having all this fun and the rest of it, but we're here to win? Yeah, I mean, that happens in every football club, I'd imagine, and certainly in ours, but usually behind closed doors. I've had my time again. I might not have done it out in the middle of the MCG, but I think every player is is motivated by different things, whether it's carrot or stick, whether it's a big cuddle or a, mm. or a bit of a slap. You know, I think that the players will respond well to the thing that works for them. And working that out is a big part of coaching. And that was to Jack Scrimshaw. And if you look at his season, he's been absolutely phenomenal. So we've been really open about how we well, chat about those I you say about, you know, you might go behind the scenes. Because when I saw that at the time, I thought, wow, that, that's, that's good. You, you're not putting up with it. Because we're sitting at home, everyone watches the game. People aren't mugs. They see what's going on. And if you, were, if, if you got anyone out of the crowd to go down and address the, the team that day, they would have done exactly the same. So it's sometimes reaffirming without, you know, humiliating players to give them a whack like that. And everyone's lifted according. Could you feel it that week that suddenly there was a change, was a jolt? Well, I think it was coming at that point. I, I, a lot of people have said, oh, what was the turning point of the season? And it would... There's not really one moment. There's a few key things that happen. I think post the, the Gold Coast game in round five, the players took a lot more ownership. And then, drive, I mean, every club will talk about driving standards. And the, the reason for that was a kick that was outside of what we were trying to do at that moment in the game. And as soon as we went into that, it was like, OK, we know not to do that. You know not to do that. So the fact you're doing it is putting us behind. And that's not the, san the standard that we want to accept as a football club in that moment. So um, working with him to make sure that he doesn't do those things and he continues to learn from it is, is the standard we tried to create. And that was, that was at the beginning of it. On that theme, your ability to respond to a loss. You won against the Bulldogs the next week after that particular game. And two other losses, the, the heartbreaking loss to Port Adelaide where you were so far in front and lost in the last 30 seconds or, or two seconds. And equally, the GWS game, you've responded each time. Is, is that proof to you that your message personally is getting through the way you want it to? Um, oh, I mean, I think it's not... It's, a lot is made of the head coach and my message. But I think as a collective, so many people go into making the players play the way um, that we want them to. And so they're doing a fantastic job of expressing themselves and playing with that flair and enthusiasm, but also the pressure that, that you know is important, particularly in, in September. So when we look back to the, the Port Adelaide game, we're actually really disappointed in our review of the week before. So we had, a, we had a St Kilda game that we nearly got run down and we didn't review it well enough. We didn't go into detail about why we only just won that game. And so then we learned our lesson really harshly the next week. And that stayed learnt, you know, that lesson. Um, that stayed learnt, that one. And so then we continued to learn on the, on the job and continue to grow. And um, the players have been very consistent. And whether that means we've won every game, we have played consistent footy for a couple of months now. Sam, I want to show one goal that you kicked against Carlton where it uh, goes inside uh, the forward, the, your defensive 50, and the ball bobbles out. And one of your strengths at the moment is just how dynamic your players are. And that you just see everyone go charging. Like Weddle's one of the greatest runners in the game already. And a young, you see Impey playing great footy, Connor Nash. They all just run in waves, yet you're targeting two key backs from another team in, in Barras and Josh Battle. Does that take away potentially from a strength? I know you've got to go up against Jamara and Norton and Darcy this week, but yeah, what the strength you currently got with how dynamic they are as backs versus bringing in two taller players? Yeah, I mean, we are a dynamic group, and I think I think Peter Burge has done a fantastic job of getting the, the fitness into the players and his whole team. I think the players run on top of the ground, they, they cover the ground well, and that in players like that, it looks fantastic, but um, if you... If you look at Sam Frost's year, he's played all year as the number one fullback and he has done a phenomenal job. Mm. He's one of the best, you know, one on one defenders in the competition statistically across the year. But really he's quite undersized for that role. Um, ideally he would have been the second the second back. 
Um, and and if we are able to land one of these guys, then that will help him play his role that he's more suited to. Unfortunately, we lost James Blank in the preseason, and he continues to um, recover from his knee reconstruction. So we are a little bit light on for for keys. And so if we are able to to get some talent in in that area, then that's something we're looking at. Well, Sam, it's been amazing. Uh, earlier this year, Hawthorne fans were decrying why we recruiting blokes who are five foot five and all that sort of stuff. And now it's, it's, there's, there's, they're, they're a happy team at Hawthorne. The supporters are all up, just feeling fantastic. Can you do us a favour? Can you stay with us? Because we're going to bring in Paul Marsh and Phil Davis to talk about football as a greater entity. I'm really interested, maybe I'll give you a head start on one of the questions I want to ask you. When you left Hawthorne to go and set yourself up, do you feel then for players who are getting to that part of their career, not necessarily... Christian Petrarca, but certainly he's the man of the moment on those things. So we'll get your thoughts on that when we return. 